The China in Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg. The ACRP promotes balanced, considered reporting on China Africa relations through training programs held throughout the year. More information at africachinareporting.com. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Jeronima, CGSP's Africa editor and China Global South's managing editor, Kobus van Staden in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, gentlemen. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Okay, we're going to do a week in review episode today where we're going to kind of pack in a whole bunch of different stories. We've also got a fascinating quick interview that we did with Mark Boland, who is a senior research analyst covering debt in Africa. So we're going to dive into the debt issues. This was a monumental week, guys, for Ethiopia. They became the second, or they're about to become the second African country to default on a portion of their bondholder debt. There was a $33 million coupon payment that was due this week that the government could not pay. They have signaled to the markets that they will not pay this. And so the bondholders are now in discussion with the Ethiopian government to find out how they're going to resolve this impasse. So we're going to talk about debt and get the, the situation about where China plays into this, specifically in Ghana, Zambia, and Ethiopia. Also, COP28 wrapped up this week in Dubai, and Kobus has been covering the China angle all week. We spoke with Anika Patel over at the Carbon Brief earlier this week, so if you missed that discussion, I highly recommend you check it out because she gave us the full breakdown of where China was coming from. But Kobus is going to let us know how this thing ended and wrapped up, and then we're going to segue into some of the energy projects that China's doing in Africa and see if that contrasts with some of the rhetoric that was coming out of COP in Dubai. So, Kobus, this week we had news that Ethiopia is not going to make a $33 million payment. They follow Zambia in defaulting on a portion of their bondholder debt. One of the parts of this story that keeps repeating is when we look at Sri Lanka, we look at Ghana, we look at Zambia, and now Ethiopia – that all of those countries have large amounts of Chinese debt, but it's not the Chinese debt that's causing them problems. It's the bonds that are causing them problems. Yeah, it's very interesting. Ethiopia, two or three months ago, like actually struck a deal with China to suspend repayments on its Chinese uh, loans for a year. So that came a while before this announcement, which was interesting. And even though China is one of Ethiopia's biggest creditors, it was interesting that the Chinese side of this debt package wasn't actually the problem that it was to do with the bondholders. And so the total amount of Chinese debt in Ethiopia, the last number that we saw put it somewhere around $13.7 billion. That makes Ethiopia the second largest borrower in Africa behind Angola. Angola, by the way, did go through a minor type of debt restructuring, not on the scale of what Ethiopia is going with, with the Chinese. So they're not a concern at this point. But Giro, when we look at the financial situation facing Ethiopia and in a number of other African countries, on the one hand, there's a lot of reasons to be worried. Inflation is still a concern interest rates are high. But at the other side of this, it does seem to be that a number of African countries are powering through this downturn and still holding firm. Yes, many African countries are still holding firms and they really want to keep on moving forward. And many of them are just considering not to be a big of a problem. In the midst of Ethiopia being on the verge of being another default, a Kenyan president was quite adamant by saying that Kenya is not in danger of having a debt crisis on his hand. So yes, you see that sentiment and that feeling that it's not really big of a problem for us in Africa that, you know, we're going to face that kind of crisis. I also do believe there is a sense of optimism coming from many African countries. I don't know if it's based on history or is kind of bailed them out or it's based on the facts element they have on the ground. But I know that many of them are not really worried about how the situation is presenting itself. And maybe because you don't have many African countries impacted by that, you only have few of them impacted by that. So somehow for many African countries, it's not really a problem to be worried about right now. Of course, it becomes a problem when they shape it and they put in the narrative of like China being the problem of it. But when you put it in a context of how it's presented and how it really is, and you don't really feel or see that worriness for many African leaders or, I mean, many African 
elites about that that issue happening in in those African countries. Giro, it's so interesting that you talk about this sense of optimism and the contrast in the narratives that we're seeing maybe outside of Africa and what the sentiment is inside of Africa and different African countries. That was also the feeling from Mark Boland, who is a senior credit research analyst at Red Intelligence in London. Mark is quoted in the press all the time about the debt situations and the various economic ramifications of the loan crises that are going on in some African countries. I had a chance to catch up with him earlier today to ask him about the situation specifically in Ethiopia, Zambia, and Ghana. And again, contrary to a lot of the headlines, he actually seems to think that these countries are on the downside of all of this. They're gotten over the hard part, and we shouldn't necessarily be as concerned about the default as a lot of people might think. Let's take a listen to my conversation now with Mark Boland. Mark Boland, welcome back to the show. It's great to have you on the program to help us walk through some of the debt situations in Africa. Yeah, thank you very much. It's uh, very good to be back. Mark, the New York Times this week ran a rather disconcerting headline coming from some New World Bank data that says that surging interest rates and waning financing options threaten a, quote, lost decade for poor countries. We're seeing that play out in Africa. This week, the Ethiopian government warned that it is going to miss a coupon payment for some of its bond debt. We have a situation in Zambia where the talks blew up to restructure the country's debt there last month. And then also in Ghana, a worrying situation as well, that even though the finance minister is saying that he's hoping to have a debt resolution by the end of the year, what I wanted to do today with you is just to try and sit on your perch as you look out across the developing world at the debt situation with an eye specifically on the role that China's playing in many of these countries, given that they are a major creditor. Let's start with Ethiopia. It is on the verge of becoming the latest country to default on its debt, second African country after Zambia. What is the situation in Ethiopia? And even though it sounds worrisome, even amidst these World Bank warnings, should we be worried about this pending default? Yes. I mean, I've seen the headline. There was a similar one about the Wall Street Journal and, you know, saying there's a sign of renewed pressure. I think maybe the so media narrative is a bit behind the curve here. I mean, I remember earlier this year, there was, you know, talk about there being a flood of debt defaults out of Africa, but this is actually the first sovereign default from the EM borrower this year. You had Niger in mid-year because uh, they couldn't pay because they were locked out of the uh, West African Economic Monetary Union payment system after the coup. My take is a bit more positive. I think now we're actually at an inflection point. The so Fed they just... Uh, essentially announced yesterday that it was prepared to cut rates in 2024 and that these uh, interest rates should be coming down now, which should ease the situation amongst for, you know, even also for some of these African borrowers. So I think we're possibly past the worst point here, but I think there will possibly be more defaults, but I think it's going to be more sort of a drip uh, of one or two possibly per year rather than a flood of defaults coming up. What's a little bit confusing to me is that $33 million for a country as large as Ethiopia doesn't seem like a lot of money, but apparently it is. What is the story behind this default? And also, Ethiopia is the second largest recipient in Africa behind Angola of Chinese loans. Around $13 billion or so is what's believed to be still owed to the Chinese. Firm numbers are hard to come by. Give us your take on the specific situation in Ethiopia. So Ethiopia was, if I'm correct, the second country to apply for the Common Framework back in February 2021. And I've sort of heard a criticism, which I generally agreed with that day. They didn't have a strategy when they actually applied for this uh, framework. And my take was that it was needed in order to get IMF money to apply for this common framework and actually push out the Chinese, well, the principal repayments on Chinese debt, which, I mean, they've already had issues with these previously. They come with a debt restructuring deal on the railway debt, I think, in 2017, 2018. So it goes back, Ethiopia's debt problems go back even before COVID and, of course, the uh, civil war that broke out in uh, November 2020 and uh, ran up till I think the peace deal was struck in 
April this year, of course, has also made the situation worse. So I think it's always been clear that uh, Ethiopia would not be able to repay the euro bond when it comes due in, in December next year. So I don't think it was a major surprise that that restructuring is happening. It's just a question of when. I think the reaction, the negative reaction when it was announced that they were going to uh, go into these discussions in November was mainly a you know, just to reflect that this uh, coupon payment on December 11th would not be made and just as uh, the uh, bond prices uh, adjusted to take that into account. And you had the, uh, well, negotiations started only December 8th, about a week ago. I think there has been some criticism, which I think is understandable, that this gives very little time to resolve this issue. And you had one, uh, you know, had one meeting on December 8th. There's another one. There's a call for investors today. And I've looked at the kind of different counter proposals, both this initial proposal from the government, a bondholder proposal, and then the revised proposal from the government. So there isn't actually that much difference between the two. So I do think it's possible they could come to an agreement, possibly even within the grace period, which is 14 days. Okay, well, let's move on to Zambia, where also we have this dance between the bilateral creditors and the bondholders, just as is happening in Ethiopia. This deal blew up back in November when China called on Zambia's other creditors to shoulder what they called a, quote, fair burden in the debt restructuring process after both IMF and official creditors, including the Chinese, expressed reservations about a deal that Zambia had struck with the bondholders. So here we have a situation where the bondholders then shot back and said, we're not going to take direction from the bilateral, specifically China. And once again, we are back. It doesn't seem like it's zero, but no closer to a resolution than we were six months ago in Zambia. What are you telling your clients about the status of Zambia's debt restructuring process? I would disagree. I think we are closer to a resolution than we were six months ago. I just think it's going to run a bit longer into the next year. So the IMF has said, so there are two different issues there. There was the uh, one that seems to have been resolved, which was the DSA parameters, where there was, I think, just a bit of a sort of technical problem, uh, mistakes that they've adjusted the uh, Bondholders have adjusted a proposal to essentially move payments they propose to be made in 2025 to 2024. So you're not breaching the uh, external debt service to uh, exports threshold maximum value in the DSA, which is essentially what the IMF decides on. But then it's up to the official credit committee to decide on the comparability of treatment. And I think there's more work to do on that issue because there's a uh, Rachel Savage adequately outlined in your podcast a couple of weeks ago, there's sort of three comparability of treatment. It's the net present value, that relief, it's the cash flow, and also the duration and what the bondholders now, well, their proposal, which they agreed on the government, was to essentially absorb very much of the, almost the entirety of the cash flow available in 2024 or 2025 to get the money out. So, of course, this just leaves the country in, in quite a bad situation. My expectation is that they'll have to essentially spread out this uh, expected cash flow over a longer period in order to meet this uh, comparability of treatment criteria for the cash flow. And that's primarily not so much for the official creditors, but also for the other private sector creditors, which a lot of them are Chinese. Let's quickly round up our survey of the African debt landscape in Ghana, where Ken Oforiata, who is the finance minister, has all summer from back in June and then through the fall been expressing optimism that he's going to get a deal closed before the end of the year. We are now fast approaching the end of the year and not entirely sure if we've made any progress, given that the Christmas holiday is coming up in less than two weeks. What is the status in Ghana? Again, to help us understand where the Chinese fit into all of this. So what uh, my colleagues I read have been covering is this issue with the official credit committee with a cutoff date so for uh, for the debt restructuring essentially from what the debt that comes after that should when should be excluded. I mean this is something you have in these debt restructuring, uh, especially when there's kind of this debt 
emergency debt that comes in quite late to essentially help the country, which has lost market access, doesn't have. So sometimes this debt is excluded as it's seen as uh, just satisfying the country and questions need for emergency urgent funds. And this in the uh, original common framework term sheet, it was April 2020, which is you know, when the DSI debt relief uh, was agreed. The SSI debt relief was agreed as, uh, was, you know, one proposal cutoff date, but there's still a disagreement between that and our understanding is that Chinese are pushing back against having such an early debt uh, cutoff date for the official credit debt as it would exclude bilateral debt from export credit guaranteed debt from, uh, well, guaranteed by the export credit agencies of Sweden, South Africa, Switzerland, and the UK. So I think it's more likely that the cutoff debt for the official debt will be closer to the uh, staff level agreement for the IMF program that was announced in April next, next year. That's seen as the kind of last sort of end date of, you know, when you need a cutoff for the debt restructuring. Mark, you are a rare light of optimism in this space. You're definitely a contrarian compared to the media narratives that are all gloom and doom. So it's encouraging to get your more optimistic outlook on the situation in Ethiopia, Zambia, and in Ghana. Thank you so much for taking the time. Mark Boland is a senior credit research analyst at Red Intelligence in London. Mark, if people want to follow what you're reading and writing, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you? Well, I think Twitter, I'm old enough to still call it Twitter. I think my handle is at Mark with a K, Boland with an H, B O H L U N D. That's, I think that's still my handle. You can also follow me on LinkedIn where every other week I put up the uh, front cover of our sovereign debt radar, which I published yesterday, which has a lot of interesting material. So I think that's the best uh, venues uh, to follow me. Fantastic. We'll put links to both of those in the show notes. Mark, really appreciate your time today. Okay, thank you very much, Eric. It was a pleasure to be on again. The kind of things that Mark has to say in his analysis is easy to follow. It's not. This is tough, complicated stuff. But at the end of the day, for some of Africa's largest economies, understanding these debt issues is critical to understanding everything else. I mean, we see in Zambia, Hishilema, the president, is about a year away from starting a presidential campaign. And if he doesn't have these debt issues under control, it's going to be a big part of his presidential campaign. So, you know, this is fundamental to so many other pieces. And again, it's wonky. It's tough to figure out. But all I was thinking about, Kobus, as Mark was talking, again, you know, there's a resilience that we're seeing here from these countries, that the system, the rules-based international order that we hear so much about, the international monetary and international financial system has done nothing for these countries. Nothing. I mean, nothing. I mean, there's, it's, it's just, it's infuriating what we've been watching over the past three years. And yet somehow, as Mark is pointing out, they're powering through. They're getting through this. He's more optimistic than I've heard from a lot of people. And, and Mark is a guy who knows. He's in London. He's watching these things. So a lot of resilience there. And again, this is the theme, I think, of the show in this segment of the show. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. I mean, it's heartening to hear that they're kind of muddling through. You know, like what we've seen, particularly in Zambia, is a lot of cancelled projects and some kind of big questions being asked about, for example, healthcare spending in relation to massive austerity measures imposed by the government as they're trying to deal with this. So it'll be interesting to see how that kind of social spending shifts, you know, over the next while. But yeah, it's, it's you know, kind of, um, uh, you know, it's, it's heartening to know that to hear that they're moving forward. And after the show, after he and I recorded our segment, we talked about Kenya and the standard gauge railway debt and how the Chinese have been unrelenting and the China Exim Bank has been unforgiving in terms of delaying or deferring repayments of that debt. The, that's been tough for the Kenyans, no doubt, because they've had to divert hundreds of millions of dollars every year to debt servicing costs to pay for the standard gauge railway. But again, looking at the optimistic side of this, they're paying this thing down by five to six, seven hundred million dollars every year. So we're on the downside of that debt repayment cycle as well. So Giraud, it does seem like that in a few years, Kenyans will be relieved of a considerable portion of their standard gauge railway debt, difficult as it may have been to repay it. Hopefully Zambia will have its debt restructuring piece in order. I think the key comes now is to whether or not future African leaders, those who succeed Hishilema and Abayi in Ethiopia will be as disciplined as the current set of leaders seem to be in trying to restructure these debts. 
Yeah, that will depend on, first of all, the international environment. Let's hope that we don't find ourselves in the midst of a new pandemic, because if it does happen, we might have much more problems. And the second element will also be the ability to see how much this financial crisis transforms itself in an economic crisis in those countries. Because most of these countries so far, are, from what I've read and what I'm seeing, we don't see the economic impact yet in terms of like everyday life of people really feeling in how much is really starting to impact them. And I think for many of them, so far, if they manage to keep a certain appearance of a normal sea in the way the economic world is working in the country, they lessen the impact of how the everyday people are impacted by that. They can still manage and they can still power through the situation and being able to move beyond that. So yes, it's also going to depend on those who are going to come after that. In the case of Ichilema in Zambia, he's going to have to find an argument for himself for election coming in, 20, I think it's 2026, how he's going to power through that, how he's going to present the situation. Hopefully for him by 2024, something might happen. So for William Ruto, I don't know, it's going to be a very tough sell because he can still spin it around by saying it was not really his choice. He kind of took the mantle based on the situation that was left for him by his predecessor that that's now he's opposing to. But now he can still find a way to spin the messages and move forward with that. But the general context, as you say, is how African countries are going to manage all this debt crisis and how they're going to move forward and to really have a much more sustainable way of managing those finances. Because I do believe that we have a huge problem that we need to resolve ourselves in terms of how do we manage debt and why do we contract debt and how we move beyond that. So yeah, I think it's a really serious issue that we're going to consider for the coming months or years at least for those three countries. Well, just very quickly, speaking of William Ruto, earlier this week, he gave a very upbeat report that Kenya is, quote, and I'm going to quote him here, out of the danger of over-indebtedness, thanks in part to the fact that the Kenyan economy grew by 5.4% over the past six months. So one of the success stories. So here we are again, Cobus, back in the Africa rising. <laughs> and, you know, we thought that was over. But these, again, are, are more resilient economies than I think a lot of people gave credit to. And that's really quite interesting. The public debt, total public debt in Kenya does stand at more than 10 billion shillings, about 64 billion euros, which is somewhere around 65 to 70 billion dollars. I don't know what the exchange rate is these days, but it's still quite a bit. Again, just to put the Chinese debt in context, the last that we saw the Chinese debt was about $6 billion. That number's probably come down quite a bit because there have been some sizable repayments in 2023, so maybe closer to 4 or $5 billion now, but that still stands at less than 8%, 7% of the total debt. So again, I just put those numbers out there because when you hear a lot of the conversations about Chinese debt, and Kobus, you wrote about this this week in a U.S. congressional report that came out that just had some fantastical numbers. I mean, just wild numbers about Chinese debt levels in Africa. When you see them against the total, oftentimes in a place like Kenya, it's less than 10%. So again, that context really matters. And I mean, we don't have to go into too much detail, Kobus, but we're still seeing a lot of the distortions coming from not only the US, but also even in Africa in the reporting of it. Yes, that report was a bit baffling because some of the best work, well, you know, kind of like I think like by far the best work actually on tracking Chinese lending to Africa are all done at American institutions and all of that data is public. So I don't know, like there, there was a lot of like weird sources being cited in that report coming up with quite strange numbers, among others kind of leaving out very large you know, Chinese loans to countries like Angola, and at the same time, you know, wildly overstating the, the proportion of Chinese loans to countries like Ghana. And then that was duly also picked up by, it, it went viral on social media, kind of a, a list of these countries, supposedly the ones most indebted to China in Africa, that list went viral on social media and was then picked up by the mainstream media in Africa. So it was a kind of a bit of a mess, you know, it was just like a, like a compounded misinformation kind of landing on top of other disinformation. So so it's problematic, I think. We can't confirm that it was active disinformation. Yeah, it was which misinformation. It I would sounds guess. like it was more misinformation. I'm actually going to reach out to the folks next week who put that report together to try and get some clarity on what they meant. Uh, Giro, let's get the last word on debt issues from you before we move on to COP28. 
Yes, my last comment would be the confidence that we are talking about right now can just be shown by how Kenya is behaving. William Ruto, despite all the numbers that we have been citing about Kenya's debt, is still reaching out to Chinese to find money, to find financing for his various projects. So it kind of shows you that somehow the guy is still, I don't know, is still confident about the state of its own economy and is not really worried much about how the debt is really impacting his country to the point that he's still seeking for more Chinese money into the country. Let's see how it's going to play out in the future. Well, also this week, the big story that came out of Dubai was the wrapping up of the COP28 annual environmental confab. This was the largest ever. In many ways, it was the most contentious ever as well. Kobus, you have been covering this almost every day this week and throughout the COP28 session that lasted almost two weeks or two weeks, actually more than two weeks. What have we learned uh, out of this COP and what do we take away from the Chinese position? It was notable in the UN climate process that this was the first time that phasing out fossil fuels was actually like really discussed. It sounds insane, but here we are. Like it took 30 years for them to actually talk in, in, in real terms about phasing out fossil fuels. And they didn't really 100% get there. There was a big talk about, a big discussion about whether uh, like about around a phase out or phase down of fossil fuels. They ended up not going with either, but they ended up settling on language around transitioning away, quote unquote, from fossil fuels, which is weaker than, than a phase out, but still better than nothing, which it was for 30 years. So they reinforced the, the general goal that 1.5 degrees centigrade is what we should aim for, even though a lot of activists have said that that, you know, that, that budget has basically been used up. So that was uh, at least getting transitioning away from fossil fuels on the text was a big win, actually, even though it, it's, it sounds, you know, very small. But they also got some, you know, kind of new agreements on controlling methane, which came out of talks between the US and China. And it was the first that was a significant one, actually, because um, it was the first time China really committed to tracking and, and controlling methane. A lot of, like, China is responsible for a lot of methane pollution. So that was a big win. Methane is even more powerful greenhouse gas than uh, carbon dioxide. So that is, it's, it's important. There was also some big failures. In the first place, a lot of countries, including China, pushed back to this idea that global emissions should start to fall in 2025, even though China's own emissions is likely to start falling around that time. China also... You know, refuse to commit to double um, fuel, like uh, economic efficiency, economic energy inf- efficiency uh, by 2030. Even though China is one of the most, as has, has done the most work, or some of the most work in the world in making its economy more efficient. Part of why they refuse to to support that is that they are worried about actually meeting that target. And so there's a feeling that they've, they've actually covered a lot of the lo- low-hanging fruit in their in increasing their, their efficiency up to now, and that the next doubling will actually be quite harder to achieve and will take quite a lot of structural kind of like re- rearranging of the, of the energy economy within China. So that raises a bigger issue in relation to these UN processes, which is that a lot of countries tend to over-promise and under-deliver. And China is, is actually interesting in that respect in that they tend to underpromise and overdeliver and tend to be very wary of side deals that would kind of commit them to what they feel like is overpromising and in generally kind of wary of looking too enthusiastic so you know all very interesting it's interesting you say that one point on the overpromising under delivering another interesting statistic that came out was that China doesn't contribute much at all I think anything to the loss and damaged fund this is the fund uh, supposedly the wealthy global north countries are supposed to pay into as some kind of reparation for global south countries who have been suffering the effects of climate change China said uh-uh that's not for us so a lot of people have been critical of China over the years on that, but some research came out this week as well that pointed out the fact that the Chinese have actually spent more than many global north countries in various other programs related to climate change mitigation. Yes. And so if you added up all of those different initiatives together, it would be more than the loss and damage contributions that, that many countries are making. So interesting just observation that research sometimes reveals some of these interesting nuances here. Speaking of loss and damage, Jiro, that was a big part of the African agenda at COP28 was to get the wealthy countries to pay more into it. It looks like they got almost $200 million for the Alliance for Green Infrastructure in Africa to build new green infrastructure. That money came from Germany, France, and Japan, as well as a number of philanthropic organizations. So when we look at what Africa 
walks away from COP28, do you get the sense that they're happy or that this delegation, and I say Africa as a singular entity here because in many ways the continent did negotiate as a singular entity, so not speaking as Africa as a country here, but the fact is that the delegation did unite in some of their demands. What do you get the sense is the feeling among that African delegation in, in what they walked away from COP with? I think they would have expected to get much more than that. They would expect. Well, that to- was just for one. That was just for one deal. So they did get more. Yes. Yeah, so that's the feeling of like now to get from the deal, it's always the question how, when they promise and how they're going to deliver for that. Now it's now the project like to find those projects to finance and to really work on those projects to make that happen. And most of the time you get the feeling that when they sign those deals in those different cups, there are many things that are said, but when it comes to deliver in terms of project, either on the funding side, either on the African side in terms of preparing for those projects, something just goes array and people aren't ready for that. At the end, the number that was going to be delivered is not always the one that's been you know, put on the ground and puts on the table. So for me, I I got the feeling that, yes, they are kind of happy in a certain way, but not fully happy because when you talk with different African delegations, with different African authorities who've been there, who've been following the COP28, they were expecting much more than that. They were expecting, you know, to talk about billions and to see how much different countries are going to get out of this. Already the loss and damage fund, nothing much has really moved on that side. So they're kind of feeling that, Yeah, it's not nothing, but it's something, even though we wish we could get much better than that. Yeah, Africa did not benefit as much as people anticipated from loss and damage the first round, but go ahead. Well, loss and damage fund got operationalized at the scope. So that's a kind of a big... What does that mean? Can you explain what that means? It means it's been institutionalized, you know, and and now they have to work out exactly how it's going to be managed and how it's going to work and how to build capacity to do it. But like there wasn't zero movement on that. I think like it it became much more of a formalized entity at the SCOC after being agreed at the previous one. But the question will be like, how long is it going to take us from operationalizing it? Because those conferences tend to put the principle on the table, but when it comes to really to implement it, we goes from round to round of negotiation, round of negotiation, before getting something really done on the table. And that's, for me, the parts where personally, and I think that many people are worried about that, like, yes, we have the principle, you know, to kind of calm down people, to kind of calm the people frustration, but when and how are we really going to see that happen? and becoming really something operational on the continent or in the world, we still have to see that happen. Kobus, lots of confusion over the past couple of weeks in terms of China's status. A lot of people were saying China is no longer a developing country and they should be classified as a developed country. Other people saying that China is doing more to push for green transition, yet at the same time we see these staggering statistics about how much coal power every year was added to, you know, tens of gigawatts to the Chinese grid. So again, lots of confusion. The Chinese themselves, uh, Xie Jianhua, who is the climate negotiator, he not very forthcoming. So we have to read between the lines. So some of it is the confusion over China's development status. Others, it's just the fact that the Chinese are not very communicative on this. I want to bring up to you guys some transition points in Africa that seem to be underway And as COP was going on, news was starting to cross that the Niger-Benin pipeline that the Chinese built, PetroChina paid for most of it, it officially launched in November 1. They announced this week that it's going to be operational in January. So here we're going to have a very important pipeline in West Africa. We've got the East African crude oil pipeline, the very controversial Franco-Chinese partnership in Uganda. And then there's a $6 billion refinery that's in development in Angola, the Lobito refinery. That is going to supply Southern Africa with refined fuels. So while we're talking about phasing out of fossil fuels, the Chinese seem to be building some very large oil projects in many parts of the continent. What are we to make of that, Kobus? Well, the Chinese aren't the only ones. So, you know, oil change, so which is an NGO that follows oil and gas in investment, recently put out a, a report saying that the US, Canada, Australia, Norway, and the UK are by far the biggest kind of planners of new oil and gas fields through 2050, uh, making up 51% of new ones. And with the US alone, making up about a third. So this is one of the complications, not only, you know, China is a very ambiguous player at these COPs, among others, because as you said, 
they're bad communicators, but also because they are strategically undercommunicating. A lot of the kind of ambiguity in, in their position is also to ensure maneuverability. But what we do see is that there is an expectation that China will reach the tripling of renewables domestically, will reach that well before the general kind of cutoff for that, and that China is doing so relatively well with controlling emissions that they're actually planning on announcing new 2030 and 2035 emission targets in two years. What's very confusing is that even though the US and Europe are kind of positioning themselves rhetorically you know, for the phase, phase out of fossil fuels, and that's great, those are coming mostly from the governments themselves. And, you know, there's a disaggregation in terms of like of Western power. So even though Western governments are, are, are talking this talk, Western companies are following their own agenda, right? So it becomes very confusing to break it down by country. But, in, you know, in that position, China's both... I think in lots of ways quite inspiring in terms of having having really implemented a lot of changes domestically, like building and you know you know um, through things like controversial means like subsidies, for example having built up a huge uh, renewables industry in China, which now a lot of a lot of global North countries are actually so worried about that they're actually trying to kind of slap th- tariffs on it. And these moves are actually holding back green transitions in, in, in many parts of the world. But be that as it may, what we're seeing is that China has become such a kind of a unique mover in, 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 in the, the scale of its renewable industry that there's no way around working with China on, on these different issues. But at the same time, China is also positioning itself, you know, kind of as part of this kind of self-self solidarity. It, sh- it provides cover to many massive polluters in the global south you know so for example it supported indonesia in 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 holding out against coal phase out targets for example you know it it works you know weirdly even though they have terrible relationship it it kind of works in the same way with india and so you know china very very ambiguous very complicated player you know kind of in all of this but increasingly a crucial one i think well that discrepancy is very interesting that you talk about because for all of the lofty rhetoric coming from the United States, Europe, Canada, Australia, and others. The United States oil and gas production this year went up. So, you know, again, this is the part that I don't understand is where do countries like Norway and Canada, or even the United States who are, I mean, they're they're basically, Norway's a petrostate. Canada, in many ways. Yeah, Canada's a petrostate too. Basically a petrostate. And then Australia's a coal country. So I don't quite understand all the lofty rhetoric coming out of those countries in terms of climate. Giraud, I had a conversation the other day here in Saigon with an environmentalist, someone in civil society, and they kind of didn't take the cop stuff too seriously because this whole talk about phasing out of fossil fuels, what she didn't understand was how's that going to work in a poor country like this? There's no charging infrastructure. The power grid barely works enough to power industry in this growing society. And this idea that in 5, 10, 15 years, they're going to magically switch to a a green, carbon-free grid and energy system isn't going to work because what she was forecasting to happen was that the rich countries are going to be decarbonized and the poorer countries are going to get all of the crappy cars that they used to have and they're still going to be using coal because they can't afford anything else. And they're going to be relegated to the second-class status in terms of energy. And I think a lot about the DRC and other countries in Africa that I think are in the same situation. Exactly, yeah. The feeling is that those COP summits are now perceived much more of like developed rich country debates. Those who already reached the level of development now, they, they have the luxury of thinking, how can I switch my car from power engine car to electrical car? And you bring that debate among people who don't have electricity, we don't have water, we don't have even a car. And you ask them not to cut trees or not to do this or to reduce, not to use fossil fuel. It's a debate for them like, you know, you guys, you just, you already climbed the ladder and now you want to remove the ladder from us you have to find us to build a much more expensive ladder to climb on to get to that development level so yes the feeling is like that debate is quite unfair from the poor developing countries we still need to develop we still need to find the resources for them to move forward in the development process so that's why the loss and damage debate for me becomes a kind of important because if it becomes a very important found 
you can find like they can really have the narrative to explain why okay we are providing the resources for you to also reach to that level but if we don't do that if there's no substantial money put on the table you cannot just come and ask poor country developing countries to deprive themselves from the resources they do have right now no asking them not to use them for the development and wait for greener better solution and let's say it costly solution for which they don't have the money for right now so this is where for many developing countries that debate is just like for rich powerful countries that wants to find a new way of spending i don't know to green the economy without really solving the issue of development for many african countries and just to bring this back to the beginning of our conversation for all of that money that's going out the door for debt servicing that's less money that's being spent on climate mitigation and cobus that is really the crux of the problem for a lot of countries is that you can't pay for both oftentimes and there's just not enough money to go around Exactly. You have to choose. You have to pick and choose. And mitigation and adaptation were two of the big issues that didn't get enough focus at this year's COP. That many people raise, you know, kind of as one of the issues that needs more attention and that actually isn't, is not getting more attention. And, you know, kind of with that then, as you say, you know, kind of debt development and climate, they're a nexus. They work together, right? Kind of they're, they're not separate problems in Africa, like each affects the other. So all of these issues have to be solved at once and none of them are being solved at the moment. Okay. Well, let's leave the conversation there. Gentlemen, thank you very much. We're closing in on the end of the year. Next week is going to be our last show of 2023. And you know what that means, Cobus? We've been doing this now for 14 years. So the last show of the year is our annual year in review, year in preview show. So the trick is, and Joe, I think this can be the first time you'll be joining us for this. It's an annual tradition. Is the second time, did you do join us last year for it too? Second time, I think. Okay. Well, then you remember how we do it. We each pick three topics uh, for our top three stories uh, of China-Africa relations. I think this is going to be a much more difficult year to do this than it was in the past because China-Africa relations have entered a new phase that is far less dynamic than it was a few years ago. And Kobus, you and I, early on, remember we would have th- each have three topics that were completely different from one another. Completely different. I don't think that's going to happen this time. It's uh, It'll be interesting to see what you guys come up with. We don't tell each other in advance what our topics are, so it's going to be a little surprise. And then we have one story to look out for in the year ahead. We already have some amazing shows planned for January, so I'm really excited to tell you about those. We have some great new initiatives that are underway on our website. If you go check out our site at chinaglobalsouth.com, Regular listeners who have heard us talk about this website over the years and maybe not have gone to see it might want to check it out again. This thing is packed. It's just amazing. We just launched a brand new multimedia interactive report on quartz mining. It's not really mining, but it's quartz. What, what would you call it? You're basically scooping up large amounts of quartz sand. Yeah, it's a form of mining. It's like a Indonesia. strip mining. Basically. It is kind of mining, I guess so. It's a form of mining, but it just doesn't feel as kind of going down into the trenches. Our colleague in Jakarta, Antonio Timmerman, just launched a brand new interactive report on quartz. That's part of the solar panel supply chain. Uh, Giro, you're going to be updating your data set on cobalt in January. We've launched a brand new video section, and we've got this incredible research hub that is in development that will also launch in January as well. So really exciting to see the expansion of all the great work that the team is doing. And so we just need your support to keep it going. So if you would like to follow the work that Giro, Cobus, and the rest of the team are doing, it doesn't happen for free. This news requires a little bit of support, $19 a month is what we're offering, and then $199 a year for a subscription. We think that's very good value for the price of what you're getting, and it supports independent journalism that is, again, what we think is an antidote to the rising levels of misinformation, disinformation, artificially generated content, and it's just becoming more important than ever, but it does require your support. Go to chinaglobalsouth.com slash subscribe. And, Giro, tell everybody about our Patreon community. We are just so excited about this great community of people who we have a wonderful time interacting with. Giro is the manager of that community. Tell everybody about what they can do if they join this community. 
I'd like to start first by really thanking our current Patreon community. They've been really faithful with us for so many years. They've been supporting us, the work that we do faithfully every month. They give their money to really keep us going. And I uh, really want to thank them for their availability when we talk to them, when we exchange with them as well. So yes, for our Patreon community, you are really welcome to join us, to supporting us in the work that we do in the China Global South. And when you join the Patreon community, you're going to have a wide range of perks that uh, you're going to benefit. And those who are top tier Patreon community, they have the opportunity to have a one-to-one talk with us where every month we kind of give them our deep analysis on different issues they'd like us to talk about. And uh, yes. And you get a mug. All the $20 people, and they also get a subscription. So it's a pretty good value. They get a subscription, they get the mug, and they get so many things. And with the different content we keep on creating now, now we're making videos, that we always keep on looking new ways of satisfying our Patreon community because for us, they're really supporting us. They're really our family. So if you really want to join us, if you really want to have a kind of behind the curtain sneak peek of what we do, of what happened, and really what's going to happen and what we're preparing join the Patreon community. You're going to get really something that many of many out there are not getting from us. So yeah, really welcome to join us. You'll find a link to the Patreon community in the show notes or just go to patreon.com, look for China Global South and you'll find us. So Cobus, Giro and me will be back again next week for our final show of 2023. Until then, I'm Eric Olander. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Tag us on Twitter at China GS Project and visit us at ChinaGlobalSouth.com. If you speak French, check out our full coverage at projetafriquechine.com and Afriquechine on Twitter. That's Afrique with a K. And you'll also find links to our sites and social media channels in Arabic.